Hello and welcome to Artifacts, the monthly uh, arts show on City Cable 34. We've got a show I'm looking forward to today. Um, we've got later on two guests, Holly May and Leslie Ball, who are doing some fun and creative things at the Jungle Theater. But we're going to start out talking with Sandy Augustine, who is a dancer and uh, is involved in quite a few other things. So Sandy, thanks and welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad Sarah. to have you here. Um, I first saw you before I met you. You were dancing in a show, Choreographer's Evening, mm -hmm. uh, down at Nicollet Island. Mm -hmm. And I've since seen some other things and some of the promotions and things. Can you describe the dance that you do? What kind of dance are you involved in? And um, well, the style is modern dance. Um, I was trained in the Nikolai technique, which is uh, Alan Nikolai is a choreographer um, who's based in New York. Uh, and his company has been around for some Ooh, maybe 30 years now, um, and uh, has toured internationally. And my mentors are students of his, former company members of his. So the uh, avenue I've taken is more of a German expressionist um, style of modern dance. German expression. Can you describe that a little bit for the uninitiated? <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on um, the spot. Well, if you're familiar with um, locally based Nancy Hauser, who passed away not, not too long ago, um, her teacher was Hanya Holm, and their mentor then was uh, were some people, Mary Wigman, who was uh, a German dancer who came over from Germany, um, who started modern dance there as, modern dance was sort of a rebellion uh, against um, other classical forms of dance, i.e. ballet. Mm -hmm. Ballet, um, which is, uh, I guess the concept is to be light and life and up in the air and modern is more um, earthbound or more grounded. started that way yeah mm -hmm. grounded and and the first few modern dancers were very you know the, the, the movements were even very rebellious so to speak and from there it's become more of just a, a free expression um, form of movement and so anything really goes now Nikolai uh, in my Recall is, is off the East Coast, is that mm -hmm. where That's he's correct. based and that company's right. based? Right. And where did you study and how did you get involved? I um, didn't start dancing until I was in college. Um, actually, my senior year in high school, I, I got to perform with the Minnesota Opera Company, sort of on a whim, and it, it got the wheels turning. So uh, I was looking for a dance program combining some social work efforts that I thought I should be involved with as, and as well. Um, something that I thought I was good at doing, which was dance. And I found a dance therapy program in Madison, Wisconsin. So that's where I went to school um, there and uh, worked with a woman, Claudia Melrose, who was a former Nikolai company member. She was one of the original members. So she was really my mentor. That was your introduction into that the, was my the Nikolai school, right. as it were. Right. And then uh, after graduating, I came back here and met my former dance partner, Rob Esposito, and we formed a, a partnership and toured for about five years. And you've mentioned that you've toured around. Can you just uh, share with people a few of the places you've been to tour and take um, your dance? Well, we've been we've done a residency in Missouri. We've done some um, different arts camps in Poinette, Wisconsin, Interlochen, Michigan, uh, South Dakota, and also down in Mexico City at the Ballet Folklorico. That sounds like fun. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. It was great fun. It was right before the earthquake, so we had it timed. Well, yeah, that was so, good. Yeah. <laughs> you made the movement happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't know about that. That's I don't great. Know if we made the earth move. You, you uh, took to this in college. Mm -hmm. Is that usual? Is that a typical way somebody uh, um, is introduced to dance? It's not. It's not very common. Although it's it's much more likely at a later age with modern dance than it is mm -hmm. with ballet. Um, but I, I was very intimidated when I started because a lot of my peers had been dancing for nine years and had been mm -hmm. in. Ex company, you know, and had toured and, and had a lot of professional experience, which I hadn't had. But had you been active in any other art forms before? Um, what, were, what were you doing in Madison before you met these folks? Um, well, actually, I came there um, and entered the dance therapy program right when so I came. So you knew you wanted to. Go so I knew and do I that. wanted to do that, but I really didn't know the extent of the, um, you know, performance aspect of it, which is, you know, really um, interwoven into the program. So it was something I had to get used to. So there's the physical and the, and the artistic side of it. How about surviving? I mean, how does a, I know you do a lot of things in your life. Right, right. Many of which are related to movement and dance, but Fortunately. How, how, does, yeah, how does somebody survive in the early 1990s as a dancer? Um, well, I, I think of myself a lot as a juggler. 
who's, who's very fortunate. I'm very fortunate to be employed by some people who understand um, the importance of my art. I, uh, I don't know, I work part-time as a, um, an assistant at a rehabilitative service. I do supervise exercise programs for individuals who've been injured. Um, How do they relate to that? I mean, do they take to that well? Is that something that seems natural to them? Um, the exercise? Yeah. Um, actually, no. A lot of people are not familiar with moving their bodies, even to exercise. You know, they've had things in school or, right. or have but a concept of it then. is. Yeah, there's some resistance. Um, there's an unfamiliarity with it that's intimidating. And I work on machines, and I also do just sort of free exercises and stretching and mm -hmm. um, work with them that way. And eventually, um, I, I would say that 99% of the people leave better for having gone through the program. Some good, good success. Yeah, good success. Good. What else do you do? Um, I also work with flowers. I do design and sales mm -hmm. part time. Mm -hmm. I uh, I teach corporate fitness. Describe that corporate fitness. Is, is that like getting the bottom line healthy for I, uh, some major corporation? Or what? I I go into the corporate setting. Um, and uh, just teach aerobic classes for the employees. Okay, so it's for the employees, health, the well-being of the employees right. at uh, Minneapolis right. Twin City-based companies and things like that. Right. Is that common? Does that go on? Uh, it's not as common as it should be, unfortunately, but the companies that do employ us the, um, are, I would say, ahead of their time. Mm -hmm. They're preventing injuries and they're, mm -hmm. they're thinking about their employees. Okay. Um, welfare. I've heard of things like yoga and things in the workplace. Right. And it sounds like maybe an extension of that, really right. get them up and moving. And Definitely. Healthy employees work better, maybe. Yeah, like I'd, I'd say that. Now, in October, I know you were involved in a performance at the Southern Theater, and I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. And then I believe we've got a, a, a tape of something that's coming up in November. What are some of the things you've done recently? Okay, recently, um, the performance that I was in in October was at the Dance Lines. That was for John Munger. Um, and other than that, the, the last show I was in before that was um, at the Southern Theater as part of the Loft Off the Page uh, Writers and Performance Series with my friend Alex Pate. That will be upcoming in November as part of the National Performance Network um, okay. convention that's happening here in town the beginning of November. Can you briefly describe what the National Performance Network is? Sounds like it's a group of... Uh people that are responsible for getting shows put on in venues around the country? Or? Right, right. And they come here to talk about art and the um, state of art and to see as much art as they can while they're here, performance art. And not all dance, I take not it. Not all dance. Right. Every, um, you know, music and well, And knowing art. Alex a, a bit, it, you've got words and movement then, I would assume, in mm -hmm. the piece that you're doing. Right, right. Okay. Well, let's, let's take a moment and uh, take a peek. I think it's a minute or two long and we've mm -hmm. got a piece of tape from uh, what people have an opportunity to see in November. Visions of a Voodoo Child. That's the title. Right, right. Good. This piece.
was nice to see. Can you tell us who was in that piece that we would have just seen? Um, that was Alex Pate and myself, and then uh, two dancers that I worked with, uh, Sherry Flagg McHugh and Maria Franklin Nelson, who I work with quite often. Okay, I think I've seen the name in a couple of programs. Yeah. Now, that is going to be early November where? Uh, at the Pillsbury House as part of the uh, late night showcase for the NPN National Performance Network okay. uh, showcase at 10.30 that night, and it's free. Great, free. So it's free. Good so price. So we, we're encouraging a lot of people to come. There will be a lot of other different uh, performers as well. And that's in the there. first floor auditorium there? Right. Nice right space the theater. for this sort of thing. It's great theater. Now you do other things at Pillsbury House. Mm -hmm. What else are you doing there? I'm in residence there, mm -hmm. um, which basically means that I'm a resident group of uh, several that are there. Um, I'm part of their cultural arts and heritage program and I've I've so far produced three shows there. I've got this upcoming Sandy's Back, new and improved, the beginning of December. I want to interrupt for a second. Sandy's Back has an interesting story. Now, that's yeah. the name of sort of a recurring piece of work that you do. Right. And I, I think it was a part of that that I saw at Choreographer's Evening. Mm -hmm. And you had one of the, the most interesting uh, promo pieces for that. Could you show us? You, you've got it sure. here. Sure. Yes. Um, and what's the story behind this that we're looking at now? Um, this particular one, well, Sandy's Back, um, I said if I ever do a concert, it's going to be called Sandy's Back because I've been gone so much. And the last time I was gone was in Texas for six months, and I, I couldn't wait to get back to Minneapolis after being down there. No offense, but it was, it was pretty horrible. Um, so I came back, and I also had injured my back as well. I sprained my back. Um, Taking an African dance class. In a class. In oh. a class. Um, so I had had x-rays taken, and, and I had always thought, well, what an interesting idea. I, th I think I'll use this. Um, and so anyways, the first concert was Sandy's Back, Alive from Left of Center, just Would, for a title. Okay. And then the, the next one was Sandy's Back and other movable parts, as I had several other people in the concert with me. And then this last one was uh, Sandy's Back, Dancing from the Inside Out, which not only described the, the actual photo, but it also described where I was at in my work. I was starting to dig into my cultural roots as well. So okay. I was dancing from the inside out. And uh, just thought to use that, I'd seen um, a business card that someone had on similar um, material. So I thought, well, I'll try it. And it came out really well. And I know it's not recyclable, but you can use it for But this scraper. is an image of, of an actual x-ray of this your, is my, my x -ray. your spine, your right, back. Right, right. That's so if you're in the medical field, you will see a little scoliosis there, but oh. <laughs> we won't dwell on that. So now we're an educational show. That's yeah, good. Yeah. What, what has it meant working at Pillsbury for you? Oh, Pillsbury House, it's which been is a great experience. Um, the people there have been extremely um, supportive and have bent over backwards. I, I can't even thank them enough for what they've done for me as an artist. Um, it's meant that I've had rehearsal space free. It's meant that I've had a, a base from which to work from, so now people know where my work is performed. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I also um, am in charge of just um, directing, the, coordinating the, the dance rehearsal space, which is now opened up to, to many dancers. Um, great resource. It's a great resource. There's a lot of things happening there, and, and I would encourage anyone to, to be looking there, not just to see dance, but to see other theater and and they have programs for you know other types of individuals as well I also teach a, a class for developmentally disabled at the Pillsbury P at the Pillsbury house okay. through the skills for life program sounds mm -hmm. like a lot of good work you're involved in Sandy thanks a lot for being with thank us. thank you very much Appreciate for having your me. company it's been a okay. pleasure and we'll be back in just a moment with our next two guests but first take a look at this interesting art fact Well, welcome back. We've got two lively guests in this part of the show. We've got Leslie Ball and we've got Holly May, both of whom are involved in some productions and some nonsense, I think, that are going, going on at the uh, Jungle Theater in South Minneapolis near Lindale and Lake. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this segment. <laughs> now, what the heck are you two involved in? Let's start with uh, Holly. You've got something that's in the film world. What's going on? Right. Well, we want to make people stay up late. <laughs> you got to get a jump on your sleep because... Um, uh, I'm creating late night screening parties for the Twin Cities and serving breakfast to 
you know, more incentive. It's as opposed to going to um, that restaurant that stays open all night and, you know, where you get this, you know, you get a big selection of things but no film. You get a, a very narrow selection of, <laughs> of breakfast but big film. So you're serving <laughs> cappuccino to keep them awake and then uh, they see, what kind of films? Yeah. What, what? Uh, independence and uh, student films and animation, mostly local. Mm -hmm. And I'm open to um, stuff from other places, but uh, so that's the plug uh, to anybody that's watching. If they're doing, if you're doing 16 millimeter film, and we'll do possibly do a little eight millimeter, um, we'd love to have you uh, call and um, give us your information and well, we'll now, we'll, screen it. We'll put up a little um, uh, promo later, but mm -hmm. just for now, when and where will this be? It'll be uh, starting November 15th, Friday nights at midnight at the Jungle Theater. And, uh, That's every Friday night? Every Friday night till the end of the year, till okay. the 27th. And then you renegotiate the whole experience. Right. That's great. And it's called? Film for Breakfast. Okay, now this comes out of something else you'd just done recently. Right, Rough Tracks Roundup. It was um, uh, literally, <laughs> that's what it was. I was scrounging around for eight millimeter films, showing them at the Center for Intelligent Travel coffee bar, which is right across the street from the jungle. And... Uh, I was. I just want people to stay up late because it's so lonely here in the cities. <laughs> if you stay up later than midnight, for heaven's sake. So this that's why we've got you on the second part of the show because I know you needed to wake up a little bit. <laughs> Night owl, yeah. Now, Leslie, you're also doing something at the jungle. At midnight. At midnight, but on Saturday on nights. On Saturday. And what nights. are you doing? Well, this is an extension of an experiment that we started earlier this summer. In August, we started just a six-week experimental series to see what would happen, and what happened was the Jungle Theater and the performers and members of the audience asked us to keep going. So we went for another six weeks. We just wrapped that up mid-October and are now catching our breath and coming back the Saturday after she opens on Friday. We're going to be opening November 16th. 16th. Yeah. Saturday and running those last seven Saturdays of 1991. And what is this experience called? And this is called Balls. And it's uh, experimental is the operative here. We're asking people to debut new work. We're also inviting newcomers to, who might not have access to other stages around the Twin Cities to come join us at the jungle. They sign up right before midnight. So each evening has 10 slots that are scheduled ahead of time with known performers and then we leave four or five slots for a known you'd performers. call it open stage but it's it's a surprise guest and, and sometimes the surprise guests are also known performers who didn't know earlier in the week they could come they just come off their gig that's part of why we it's do quite it lively. I mean, it's, it's it's real current whatever very current. current now you said I mean, people that might come in and do things they wouldn't otherwise do or you might not right. see them what kinds of things well uh, we just encourage people to stretch a lot of times in this industry like all industry you get sort of pigeonholed and so someone an example is Prudence Johnson who everyone knows is a jazz singer extraordinaire she came to balls and played her accordion for the first time in front of an audience um, Curtis A came without his band and just did a number with another guitarist uh, Linda Berry, the novelist and cartoonist, she came and did a hula dance. So it, it offers the artists a chance to stretch and also to see each other's work because so often people are gigging in their own little circle. There's the dance world and the music world and the stand-up world. And here they can come off their gigs and see what each other are doing and collaborate, riff off of each other's ideas. It's, a, it's to try to get the community to build some bridges. Where did you get the idea for, for Balls at the Jungle? Uh, Balls at the Jungle, let's see. Oh, I was out in New York for the last few years. I moved out there in 89 and was attending NYU and participated in a series mm. there called No Shame that, interestingly enough, was started by Iowa people, to transplanted Iowans who were in the out big Manhattan Apple. and wanted to, they were from the Iowa Writers Workshop and they wanted some sort of venue to spur on new works and I did a couple things there and thought you know Minneapolis needs something like this sort of potpourri so but you were thinking that while you were out in New York I was thinking this when I was in New York and I came back here this summer just to work on a movie project and then I was going to head right back to New York so I thought we'd just do this balls thing for six weeks and then I'd be going back kind of an interim thing and yeah but it took off but it took off and and I've been really 
so happily surprised at especially how much the performers are taking it to heart because this is I guess there really isn't an, a venue for people to stretch I was like going to ask about that because um, I've seen a lot of interesting acts around town and a lot of interesting people doing good stuff so they're hungry to find a place like this they is there really anything else like this in the cities and I don't even think so and certainly the other thing that referring to what Holly was saying late at night my friend Ruth McKenzie calls the Twin Cities the cities that sleep <laughs> you know it's there, I just don't believe that everyone is in bed by midnight on Saturdays, Fridays, and Saturday nights. Well, a Not bunch of them are down at the jungle. The, well, hopefully, and yeah. more to come. Okay. But well, so you, mm -hmm. you both of you start at midnight. How long? Mm -hmm. Now, you, your show will start at midnight in the middle of November. An hour, two hours? How long are people going to stay up here until they uh, go to that well, restaurant? We're um, going to serve breakfast at first, and. Um, I mean, there's real food. Yeah. Oh, I didn't yeah, get that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who makes food? Old Ma Holly May, or? <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, we're serving we're serving traditional breakfast, and um, and uh, hopefully we're gonna have um, video monitors up. We had we ain't worked out the particulars yet. Okay. As far as, as, far as but like people how get to much nosh a little bit, and then. Yeah, and drink coffee so they don't. I was I'll gonna say you're not the, worried the, that just, after a meal and the lights are out, you're gonna get like fifth grade snoozing or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, and there's and and the main thing about this is I, I I want people to not be quiet when they're watching these things. I want people to interact. I want people to have fun. I'm gonna say have signs up say, please refrain from not talking and you know, <laughs> this is are your mother isn't here, <laughs> you know, you can say what you want. How do you know? <laughs> How, what kind of um, are the are the filmmakers the, there? Oh I'm, yeah, half I'm the sure time they will they're, be. They're yeah. Showing up. Um, when I was doing Rough Tracks Roundup, a lot of times the um, the person whose films were showing would bring in a bunch of their friends so that they could see. Because there's not really a venue to show films, you know, independent films around here. There's all these people making these films, and there's nowhere to show them. I know. Some, sometimes you can see them at like College of Art and Design, or years ago there used to be a little film club on uh, 26th that would show kind of popular stuff, and then there'd be a midnight series. But that's probably 15, 20 years ago. Well, um, some of the students from MCAD put on a, a thing called the Night of the Iguana, which was two nights of films of the graduate, um, um, graduating film producers from mm -hmm. there. And the turnout was amazing. It, um, it, was, it was a real happening thing, you know, and it lasted till I think, 2.15 or something like that, from midnight till 2.15. Wow. And <clears throat> I just... Um, I was really awake for that, you know. I just, I just think that there should be so much more going on. I used to live in Chicago, and that's, you know, that's that's a city that that, that you know they start at midnight, start having yeah. fun at midnight, and so and I just, um, I don't know. I'm I'm awake and alive, and would really love to have somebody to talk to, and you know, some community. And we're hoping to get a lot of people, you know, um, going to the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. to balls and film for breakfast and uh, it's sort of a sisterhood kind of a thing and, uh, and there are similarities also in that balls encourages the audience again to make noise to respond the audience is co-creator and mm -hmm. collaborator we don't have any censorship we don't screen the act so if anything's offensive people have to make noise and mm -hmm. <clears throat> it and sometimes people get pulled up on stage yeah. and involved <laughs> what, in what wild and wacky <laughs> ways <laughs> <laughs> Film later, huh? <laughs> now, what do you do? You're, you're the MC. I'm the MC. I come out and greet the crowd and explain just that, that you know, you're all here to, to be part of this experiment. So come on, make noise, have fun. And, uh, well, and, and I first saw you as a performer. That's um, right. With Runevo, the lamented uh, Runevo. <laughs> Long lamented Runevo. So do, do you get up, do you sing, do you perform? I sing or do monologues. I, I get to do whatever I you want, do. just like everyone else. That's what this Great. is about. So it's your show, too that everyone gets to just have fun. Well, you would said you'd be willing to give us a little song yeah. right here on Artifacts. Yeah, right here on Artifacts. Okay, a song so, for you, Phil. Oh, thanks. Um, so you right got one now, in mind? This is it, huh? This is it. Okay. We can do it. Okay. All right. This is, a, since I could get any musicians up at this hour of the morning, we tape this really early. Uh, <clears throat> we'll do this little a cappella number. A cappella, okay. That I wrote called a cappella. Oh, clever. Okay. Um, We'd never missed a beat before I hadn't realized that you were hearing more I wonder what you listen for I'm singing to myself 
The dearest man at the damnedest time I didn't mean to beat you to the punchline Was this the game you had in mind? I'm singing to myself There's a magic to my mornings There's a quiet in my heart there's a secret to my longings I'm still learning. Right now, I miss the parts of me that once upon I gave away so willingly. And as they all come back to me, I worry, will they recognize the melody? singing to myself. Well, thank hey, you. That was, <laughs> that was wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you've seen it in Artifacts, and maybe you can see it at the, the jungle. We've got to go in just a moment, and I want to make sure that uh, our audience here knows that what they're going to be seeing over the, um, the credits at the end of this show is a, an original by Holly May here, so that's what you'll be looking at. Because both these women are multi-talented, so I want to thank you both for being here. <laughs> this is great. Mid-November, both of your uh, events start, your series starts. Oh yeah, you've got a, um, a little promo here. <laughs> we came prepared. And there is a phone number that people can call that's for right, further the jungle, information. The Jungle Theater is 822-7063. And she didn't even we, read we it. We have our own little joint postcard that you'll be oh, receiving in the mail any day now. Get a jump on your sleep. That's right. <laughs> Great. Thanks, you both. Thank, Thank you. you. And as usual, if you're interested in further information about anything you've seen on this show, you can call uh, the Artifacts uh, hotline, which we'll uh, mention in a moment. Last month, we started a new feature, which was the Artifacts question. And uh, we asked you if you thought you knew the answer, call in. Give us an answer. Well, nobody got it right. Nobody got it right. <laughs> so uh, the answer is the Children's Theater, the Art Institute, and the College of Art and Design. So if you didn't see the question, forget it. We've got a new question for this month. And if you think you know the answer, uh, call in, because we're going to give away fabulous, a fabulous prize to the third uh, right answer that comes in. This year's question, last month we uh, talked about Heritage Preservation in Minneapolis. This month's question has to do with a communications company that got its start uh, in the Washburn Crosby Mill on the Minneapolis Riverfront. And the question is, what eminent Minneapolis communication company got its start in the Washburn Crosby Mill downtown Minneapolis? So if you think you know, call the, um, call the Artifacts Hotline, and you can find out about these two women that have been on the guest, or Sandy Augustine, too, if there's information you like about that. The Artifacts Question Hotline is 673-2234 and leave your number or some way we can get hold of you so we can send that fabulous prize. So once again, call that number if you're interested in anything we've talked about, and we'll see you next time. I'm Phil Lindsay.